IMAX screens were initially used primarily to exhibit documentaries before IMAX began converting large standard auditoriums into IMAX auditoriums for motion picture films. This is one of the main reasons most of the real 143 IMAX screens are located in museums, such as the Air and Space Museums located in both DC as well as Virginia. Since 2002, some feature films have been converted into the IMAX format for displaying in IMAX theaters, though never shooting anything with 70 IMAX cameras. This was the case until 2008 when cinema would change forever. 2008 was both the year that Iron Man would usher in the Marvel Cinematic Universe and Christopher Nolan's infamous The Dark Knight would become the first comic book adaptation to make over a billion dollars at the box office. The Dark Knight proved that not only could superhero films be cold, dramatic, and dark, but even more so that IMAX could be used as a legitimate filmmaking tool. The Dark Knight was the very first Hollywood feature to utilize IMAX 1570mm cameras for an entire 28 minutes of its runtime, something that many directors haven't been able to replicate to this very day. The term 1570 refers to the size of each frame on the negative film strip. When using other standard film formats such as Super 8, 16mm, and 35mm, the film runs vertically through the camera as the sprockets in the camera pull the film down by engaging with the holes on either side of the film strip. These holes, also known as perforations, are commonly referred to as perfs. This is also the case with 65 5-perf, also known as 570mm, which until IMAX was the largest motion picture medium at the time. When it comes to 1570 IMAX, a unique approach was taken by engineers. Instead of the film negative running vertically through the camera, capturing images from top to bottom, they decided to rotate a 570 film negative horizontally much like standard 35 millimeter film photography. This new orientation allowed for images to be captured from left to right while still maintaining an exceptionally tall aspect ratio, enabling wider and more intricate imagery. In this configuration, each IMAX frame stretched across 15 perforations, equivalent to three 570 film frames turned on their side. As a result, IMAX frames were 10 times larger than standard 35mm film frames, granting them a digital resolution roughly equivalent to 18K. Consequently, IMAX remains the highest resolution motion picture format ever developed, even to this day. Fast forward to March of 2022, an exciting announcement was made. Nolan's Oppenheimer would become the inaugural motion picture film to employ black and white 70 IMAX analog film for select scenes. While this marked a significant milestone, it wasn't the first occasion that Kodak had produced black and white 1570 millimeter film. The initial utilization of this format took place during the shooting of Adele's iconic music video, Hello, back in 2015. However, the release of Oppenheimer would offer audiences the very first opportunity to witness the breathtaking beauty of black and white 70 IMAX film projected onto the grand cinema screen in all its glory. Now, with your knowledge of both the difference between 1570 or 70 IMAX and 570 film, it begs the question, why not just shoot everything on IMAX? IMAX cameras pose various challenges due to their considerable weight, bulky size, and difficulty in handheld operation. Additionally, they come with a substantial price tag, with a single roll costing around a thousand for a mere three minutes of footage. However, one of the most critical drawbacks of these cameras is their operational noise, resembling literally the sound of a lawnmower. Back 
Cut. Let's cut. I'm playing zombie too. <laughs> Ultimately, this makes recording clean, usable dialogue practically impossible. Now, just weeks after the Oppenheimer announcement, IMAX released a statement revealing that in collaboration with Kodak, they would be developing and deploying four new state-of-the-art IMAX cameras over the next two years. This would also be a collaboration with the world's most accomplished filmmakers and cinematographers, including Jordan Peele and, of course, Christopher Nolan, both who shot their most recent pictures entirely on large format. There isn't many specifics known about these cameras, but I was able to get a little more insight about these cameras via the film legend Tyler Purcell. Tyler Purcell is a cinematographer and film enthusiast who's been working with Celluloid exclusively for the last 30 years. He runs an awesome YouTube channel called Cinema Repository, where he makes educational content on film cameras ranging from Super 8 to 35mm, film stocks, film history, and much, much more. He's very active on Facebook, and you see him frequently in the 16mm film camera groups such as Our Reflex and Aton Anonymous. I spoke to him a couple months ago, and this is what he had to say about the cameras. Yes, there are going to be new IMAX cameras and a new VistaVision camera. He goes on to say, I don't think any of the new cameras are being built from scratch. They're using existing movements and quieting them down by changing them substantially. I know a lot about the VistaVision camera, but under NDA, can't discuss it sadly. And he lastly says, all the cameras should be on a shoot later this year. He placed significant emphasis on utilizing existing movements in IMAX cameras while significantly reducing their noise levels. This development holds tremendous potential as it would enable effortless and confident recording of dialogue without any concerns. Should these cameras meet the high expectations, we might witness an unprecedented milestone in cinema history, a complete film shot entirely on 70 IMAX film. If they could extend the capacity of a single roll to capture approximately five and a half minutes of footage rather than the current duration of roughly three minutes, it would revolutionize the filmmaking landscape entirely. Such an advancement would have a transformative impact on the industry. If budgetary constraints were not an issue, IMAX would undoubtedly attract a significantly larger number of filmmakers. As a result, there would be an increased demand for even 1570 projectors, which have been gradually replaced by the newer 4K laser projectors. And despite their novelty, these projectors fall short in terms of image resolution, contrast, color depth, and saturation compared to the superior capabilities of 1570 and even 570 projectors. And although the likelihood of a resurgence in demand for 1570 projectors may be slim, it remains a hopeful prospect worth considering. In addition to IMAX, Tyler mentioned another camera with a format that holds even greater appeal to contemporary filmmakers, in my opinion. VistaVision. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the most important announcement we have ever been privileged to make. This theater is now being ready to present the first motion picture ever filmed in VistaVision. VistaVision, the ultimate in film presentation that will thrill all your senses, touch all your emotions with its unbelievable clarity. 
sharpness. Brilliance. Glowing colors. But the miracle of VistaVision was not achieved overnight or presented before perfection was reached. For years, scientists have been working in the world's greatest optical and electronic laboratories to develop this system that combines spectacular size with complete focus across the screen to bring you the perfect motion picture at last. This new type of camera, the VistaVision camera, was the result. And this is the VistaVision film negative, twice as big, twice as clear as the old style negative. VistaVision is a 35mm film format that was introduced by Paramount Pictures in 1954. This would be the first ever film format to adopt the horizontal pullover method, once again similar to 35mm film photography. This was achieved by taking a 35mm film strip and turning it on its side, providing a negative that was now 8 perforations long and twice the size of a standard 35mm film strip. The format delivered imagery of exceptionally high resolution, captivating viewers with its breathtaking saturated colors. The inaugural film to showcase this format was Michael Curtis's White Christmas, which premiered in October of 1954. Subsequently, Alfred Hitchcock extensively utilized VistaVision throughout the 1950s, and it is widely believed, as I do, that this format became synonymous with defining the distinct look, ambiance, and style of Hitchcock's films. The format required not only special cameras, but also special VistaVision projectors to actually present films in the original VistaVision format. This made things difficult as the vast majority of theaters only had standard 35 millimeter projectors. More often than not, standard 35mm film prints were struck from the original VistaVision negative so that more theaters could present films shot on the format. This would ultimately become its demise as less and less productions would use it in the latter half of the 50s, and it would eventually die out during the early 60s. It wouldn't be until the creation of George Lucas's iconic Star Wars trilogy that the format would finally make a comeback. However, its resurgence was limited to exclusive use in special effects work. The format's 8 perf negative area provided a remarkable level of flexibility for visual effect shots, making it an ideal choice. For decades, this remained the sole application of the format, with it most recently being used on Damien Chazelle's 2018 epic, First Man. Many people would wonder why the format wasn't more appealing, as you could get two times the resolution of standard Super 35 4 perf at half the cost of large format 65mm film. The answer is you are limited to one specific camera that just doesn't stack up to more modern 35mm film cameras. That is, until this year. Back in 2020, Tribe 7 made a groundbreaking announcement of their development of a cutting edge 8 perf VistaVision camera. What sets this camera apart is its ability to rival the capabilities of even the most advanced digital cameras extensively used today. The camera's innovative design incorporates a parallel digital capture system, enabling various functionalities such as recording proxies, employing a digital viewfinder, and facilitating on-set monitoring. A proxy video is simply a duplicate file of a project's source footage that is smaller in data size and lower in resolution than the original video file. Video proxies are used to replace raw footage files during post-production for far more efficient and faster video editing and rendering. This will allow for a far more seamless and quicker post-production workflow, similar to a modern day digital workflow. This could be far more appealing to more modern day filmmakers and cinematographers that avoid shooting on film primarily because of the outdated cameras in comparison to their digital counterparts. 
The camera is being used for the first time on a production being shot later this year and could serve as the catalyst for more celluloid filmmaking in the future. The fusion of the distinctive aesthetics and charm of film with the practical benefits of digital technology has been a long-held desire of mine. What makes this development exceptionally thrilling is that it marks the first significant progress in the realm of celluloid in over two decades. It holds the promise of a genuine resurgence of film, a revival that feels long overdue and immensely exciting. We may finally witness the return of film in a manner that surpasses our expectations, breathing new life into a medium that seemed distant and almost forgotten for far too long.